Oh, they are? Yep, they're here. Yep. Yep. It's a call to order for the Sparks Planning Commission meeting Thursday, March 17th, 2016. Happy St. Patty's Day to everyone. Call to order. Roll call. Commissioner Camarota? Here. Commissioner Peterson? Here. Commissioner Hewen? Absent. Commissioner Lean? Here. Commissioner Sperber? Here. Commissioner Vandalo? Here. Commissioner Bowles? Here. Assistant City Attorney Des Thornley? Here. City Attorney or City Planner Armando Ornella? Here. Thank you. This is a public meeting. Are there any public comments uh, for individuals who want to speak to the specific agenda item? There'll be another opportunity to do so. In the meantime, would anyone like to come forward for a public comment? Seeing, seeing none, I ask for approval of the agenda. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Seek approval of the minutes from the meeting of March March 3rd. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any announcements, committee reports? Uh, the only announcement I have for the Planning Commission is that instead of meeting uh, on the first Thursday of the month in April, which would be April 7th, we will be meeting on the 21st which is the third Thursday. Thank you. Are there any informational items? Uh, no, there are not. Okay. This is a public hearing. Agenda item PCN 15062. Consideration of impossible action for a site of 4.25 acres in size in the C2 zone general commercial Zoning District located at 2050 Pyramid Way, Sparks, Nevada, of a conditional use permit to request to allow the construction of a 1,200 of a 1,200 square foot retail office building, and a, I'm sorry, it, the numbers are jumping today. A 12,000 square foot, thank you, Commissioner Bowles, 12,000 square foot retail office building an approximately 2,000 square foot manager's residence and office, and an approximately 85,325 square foot mini warehouse, warehouse facility, and a major deviation request to reduce the required landscape area from 15% to 10.4% of the site possible action. Mr. Crittenden, we'll plan. <laughs> Members of the Planning Commission, Ian Crittenden, Senior Planner. Um, as stated, this is a request uh, to uh, for a commission, conditional use permit um, for the approval of uh, approximately 12,000 square feet of uh, retail space in, in two 6,000 square foot buildings, um, and the and for the the use of the property as a uh, mini warehouse site. The, uh, the size of that mini warehouse, as stated, was 83,000 or yeah, 85,325 square feet, um, and a 2,000 square foot office slash uh, manager's quarters. Um, the uh, the retail space doesn't require a conditional use permit, but we included all of these uh, items as this. Uh, the conditional use permit doubles as essentially the administrative review in cases um, like this, and so we wanted to make sure we included all of them, talked about the, the, the way the site lays out and so forth, as well as the specifics of the, the, the use of the mini warehouse and, and, and its conditional use requirement in the C2 district. As you may remember, uh, this property was rezoned. Um, a, well, the, the city council action was in January of this year. Uh, rezoning the property from C1 to C2, uh, and uh, let me get some drawings up. Um, this is actually the landscape plan, but gives a good um, general layout of the uh, the way the property lays out. Um, this street here on the left side of, of it is Pyramid Way. Um, 
there would be two commercial buildings here and here. Uh, the land, the caretaker slash office for the mini warehouse would be here, and then the mini warehouse uh, use would be um, on the east side of the property. The main entrance, the only entrance, or the main entrance for this would be here off of Pyramid Way. There'd be one entrance into both the retail space and the um, mini warehouse space to the rear. The any exits onto Richard's place are emergency exits for, for emergency vehicles and so forth. Um, there, the applicant has been in touch with uh, NDOT, who is the controlling uh, group on uh, Pyramid Way. Uh, they, they did reduce the number of uh, entrances. As you know, this used to be the old, the old uh, Rayleigh site, and there was a, a north and a south um, entrance. They've restricted it just to the southern entrance. Uh, and I've also talked to them about installing a, a median to reduce, to, or to limit right to right in and right out um, to, to reduce the, the traffic impact there on Pyramid Way. Um, The, the use of, as a mini warehouse is required to go through the conditional use permit process. Uh, there, there are uh, impacts sometimes associated with them that, that, that they just are required to go through this. Uh, as staff looked at this uh, layout and design, um, the addition of commercial space back to that property seems like a positive uh, move for that area. Uh, the uh, including a mini warehouse mini warehouse tended to be lower traffic demand and lower uh, uh, impact than uh, say like a, if if a grocery store were to go back there the, the the traffic impact on the surrounding neighborhood would be far higher uh, and so staff felt that this was uh, an appropriate use to buffer the, the the retail and the busy street out of pyramid from the residential that's happening further to the east so we felt that, that was uh, appropriate along those lines. Uh, the other piece that is being requested is the uh, major deviation according uh, uh, pertaining to landscaping. Typically in this district you'd be required to provide 15 percent landscaping in, uh, in for this kind of development. Um, as you can see there's heavy landscaping along Pyramid Way, along Richards Place, and actually along the the north property line that abuts the single family residential. Um, the, the only exterior edge that doesn't have landscaping is along the alley because that's a hard place to try to put that in. Um, the, the applicant is, has agreed to the, the understanding that while we're reducing the, the, the total area that's being landscaped for by essentially 5%, or it's more than that, but a reduction of 5% of the landscaping. Uh, they're going to provide the same number of plants as would be provided if they were landscaping the total 15%. So that will make those landscaped islands thick, lush, will we'll soften that uh, interaction between them and the, the adjacent property owners that much more. Um, the staff was able to make the findings uh, required for both the conditional use permit and the major deviation, and we recommend, we recommend approval. Uh, that's the extent of my presentation. If you have any questions, Pam? We know what is going to occupy those commercial buildings. No, as far as I'm aware, that they have not been released. The, the applicant is here. If he has some uh, information along those lines, he may be able to answer that question. Because I just heard about more traffic. Some commercial buildings create a lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. them, so. affect the surrounding properties, and that's why we require a conditional use permit. What are those impacts, do you know? Uh, because Mini Warehouse tends to be semi-industrial in nature, uh, the, the, essentially they're, they're kind of ugly, I mean, is, is really the, the short of it. Um, we have, through the uh, conditional use permit process, gone through with the applicant and put conditions to try to reduce that as much as we can, uh, better exterior building materials that face the streets. Um, tying in the colors and stuff like that that 
make it a, a less of a, a harsh uh, barrier with them. Uh, uh, that's essentially it. Could you talk a little bit more, uh, or at least a little bit more in depth, about the screening measures you've taken to buffer this project from the single family residential that is immediately adjacent to it? Sure. Uh, so the to the north is where there's single family residential that abuts this. There's an existing block wall along that property line, which is to remain. Uh, the applicant has also uh, land, put a landscape strip in there that will further help pull the, the building further from and, and buffer that with the trees and the landscaping along there. Um, the other single family residential that's really adjacent is in that triangle, which is a, a very odd piece because it's still zoned commercial, but has a residential use on it. And so there's also been a, a requirement that the block wall that's going to uh, exist along the alley actually continue along that property line as well, which will be kind of a fence against a fence situation, but we feel will help buffer those uses between from each other as well as that heavy landscaping strip. Uh, the other residential that does exist here adjacent to the property is across Richard's Place. Uh, there's some multifamily residential over here. Uh, this side is actually going to have a wrought iron fence uh, rather than a block wall, uh, but they're going to, they do have their 10 foot landscape strip that, that, that's required. They're going, there's existing trees there and there's going to be an addition of, of more shrubbery and so forth to, to help buffer those two uses uh, from each other. Thank you. I have a, I have a question or two. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned, it was mentioned the, the neighborhood. Have we gotten any responses from neighbors? I have had a few phone calls from, from adjacent property owners, um, none that left their names with me, uh, that were not excited about the use of uh, a mini warehouse adjacent to them. I did try to make sure they were aware that the, the public meeting, and I don't know if anybody's here that wants to talk about that, but I did try to make sure they had the opportunity to come in and, and, and voice their opinion. Um, no one that I talked to seemed overly adamant just not excited, didn't think that it was maybe the best thing for the location, but I, I don't remember anybody screaming at me, so that was. And the other question has to do with the um, um, median strip that mm -hmm. been, has that been proposed or agreed to, or what's the status of that? I'm, I'm not sure exactly where that sits. I know that the, the applicant has had discussions with, uh, maybe with the NDOT, and the they thing. have required that there would be a median Provided. I'm not 100% as how far back that goes, but they would be able to answer some of those questions more thoroughly. Sure. I've got more questions on that, on the traffic and everything, but I think it's more appropriate after the applicant can see what would end on for that. Would the applicant like yeah. to come forward, please? Mr. Chairman and Planning Commission members, my name is Mike Marty, and I am the applicant and the developer. The, would you like me to answer the question regarding the NDOT? Yes. Um, I've had three different meetings with NDOT um, because the access on to Pyramid Way is a right. It's not transferred with the property. So I have to make application for access back onto Pyramid Way. Um, they won't stop me but they're trying to limit the amount of ingress, egress to the property uh, due to the six lanes that they're getting ready to, as we all know, getting ready to build. So um, I've agreed to provide um, a median. Hopefully it's going to be about four feet. At one time they were asking for 12 feet um, wide. Um, the length, it has to be at least 50 feet on each side going north and south of the entrance. They have asked me to go all the way to the crosswalk and then put in um, a half moon staging area on the other side of the crosswalk. Um, one of the things that um, I, I wanted to mention before I get too far into NDOT is the part of the right in right only with NDOT, as you can see, we have three exits onto Richard's Place um, two of them were required by the fire department. Um, the third one in the middle, 
um, we would still like to be able to have as a secondary egress onto, not necessarily an ingress, but an egress to limit as much um, additional traffic going on to Pyramid Way since we only have right in, right out. So that was one of the things as Ian was talking about. Um, I don't know if we fully covered that when the fire department wanted at least two more uh, emergency fire accesses. Our materials sh sure. just show two uh, exits onto, so you're talking about three? No, no, just two, no. Right. Um, we have three entrances onto uh, Richard's Place, one at the north, one at the south by the alley, and one dead center oh, the emergency in the middle. It actually goes into the alley. Not it does, the, and that was one of the requirements that was requested by um, the fire department. Okay. So we opted to have that one as an additional emergency access. Um, but the one in the middle uh, would be one that could be uh, um, an egress only, um, because we certainly want to be able to control anybody coming and going onto the property through cards and gates, et cetera. But going out, they'd still have to push a keypad to get out that registers when they came in. So that would help mitigate some of that ingress, egress, and the right in, right out that NDOT is requesting heavily that we have. We would love to have had a third, I mean, a second entrance onto, yes, yes. <laughs> but, oh, yes. The, uh, just the whole issue of, of ingress and egress, I guess, we're going to continue using that term. Um, how many, when you have a storage unit like this, obviously people don't use it every day, but no. the, when, the, when the initial use of, of a storage unit is made, how often is it a big moving truck that somebody is uh, dropping off stuff there um, because they moved and they have to have a temporary storage or they have too much, not enough space or, you know, whatever. Correct. And, and how much is the, you know, typical uh, SUV with a bunch of stuff in the back? The, to answer that question, it's somewhere between 5 and 10 percent. Uh, 5 and 10 percent what? Of, of the, the total amount of units that would end up having an 18-wheeler. Now, part of NDOT's requirements is our ingress-egress had to meet an 18-wheel um, turning radius. Not only a turning radius, but as it would pull up to the gate just beyond the resident manager's unit, they wanted to make sure that the 18-wheeler could back up, go back into the retail space, and make the turn to get out. So even though part of the industry is to just have an office for renting units, I have always been a firm believer of having a 24-hour on-site, seven-day-a-week individual or um, a couple so that somebody is there all the time but as the conversations continued with NDOT it was always well what if what if someone goes to the hospital right and so finally it was okay based on that we would make that turn so we had to increase the width about six feet in order to accommodate that 18 wheeler fortunately um, most of our units um, are not going to be accommodating an 18-wheeler for somebody to move an entire house, but it is possible, um, which also allows, as an 18-wheeler, if it did come in one of the big moving storage vans coming through the entrance, through the gate, and then exiting out onto Richard's place instead of having to find a way to turn around. That's why an egress only or going out onto Richard's place yeah, would be um, definitely favorable. One, one of my questions first, and so you're talking on Richard's way, and I'm looking at the site map, which, and that's why I was interested in what you were saying. Site max only shows two, eight, there are two that are strictly for emergency access. There's and access. So on your drawing, it, it, it's showing that they're not. Am I missing? There's actually a third one. Third one is on the alley, not on Richard. Correct. So, but that's an emergency gate also. That's correct. So, so it, 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 
and maybe I can ask staff, but my understanding if we talk about emergency, we're, all, we're not talking for the public no. to use, right? No, absolutely not. Absolutely so not. What you're talking about is something that's not allowed, I'm thinking, right, with emergency access? Just the middle one. As you can see, if you had, for instance, a beacon storage that is an 18-wheeler come through the main right. entrance, no one. you'd want to be able to go yeah. all the way out and So exit. you're requesting, but you're, on, on our drawing, it still says emergency. Correct, and I think that that was just that. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. Because at this point, and I was concerned about that same item, at this point, you're, you're bringing everything in and out off of the main. Right, and right. I think that that was, um, unfortunately, my mistake with my architect to get that information to yeah. Ian and staff, and even when we had conversations directly with the fire department, um, we had one at the very north, uh, two of them at the north of the building, one by the retail and one by the north of Richard's Place, um, and I thought I had addressed with our site plans, because there were several that kept going back to staff, um, but that unfortunately was an oversight because then we'd have four emergency access. The middle one was, was really to be designed to have an exit only, right. not, not for an in, uh, for in, um, ingress. Okay, yes. so at this point, what, the, what we're looking at in the plot to prove this does not allow that. It's very specific, right? Okay, um, secondary thing, what I was concerned is as you're going out and I see the right in, right out, and you're discussing with NDOT, I figured that's what's going on. When you're taking a right out with something, the turning radius, isn't there a problem that you're going to actually take both lanes out as somebody's pulling? It's not going to be able to pull in to the right, right lane going north there. You're, you're going to shut down both lanes, I would think, from a turning radius Normally what happens if you want to keep it in the right lane, somebody would start the turning radius farther on their property to allow it to stay in that, get the outside lane. What, what happens here, and I'm somewhat concerned, right now if I look at that where it has to come out there to go to that north, I think if you took anything of a large truck, it would take both lanes. It would shut down everything going north there it can't pull into the right. So normally you would start and I'm following turning you. radius farther in on the property. And then, and then and it's not allowed by this thing. This thing's got a 90 sitting right there. And that truck coming out of there, wouldn't it go into that second lane? It would shut down both lanes is what I'm saying. If I, I believe that if it, at some point you had an 18-wheeler that wanted to try to pull out pull into the building, I mean into the property, right. yes. Would they have to end up waiting until somebody was exiting? Probably. And, and, and then exiting on the thing, what happens is he, he's trying to go north, the 18-wheeler, and he, and, and so I agree with you, the problem is the other. If he's trying to go north here, you're essentially shutting down everything going northbound on Pyramid. So um, it, it, it appears to me you'd want to get the turning started farther on your property. And, and the drawing I'm looking at right now doesn't allow that. And uh, maybe staff can speak to that, but I, I, I'm concerned about that. If, if we don't have another way that 18 wheelers going out, you're going to shut down everything. And the problem is, is pyramid is such a problem in that area to begin with. So I, right. I'm, I'm just saying what we can do before we try to approve a piece of property, I'm very concerned about that. Okay, so, that it, so that's the thing of looking at some way out is a real concern of mine, not just in. Um, one of the things in, in dealing with NDOT is they do not pr provide a conditional approval as with this body. Um, we have asked, but the only thing that NDOT provides is a final encroachment permit. Right. So we can't submit for that final encroachment permit without what we're getting approved here. So it's kind of like putting the, you know, the cart before the horse, and I've tried to work with NDOT to say, 
is there something? Now, some of the things that we have talked about, I agreed to, whether it was the median. Exactly. And the civil engineers have to be able to prove to staff engineers and dot engineers that the that a, a W40 is what they call it, or 50, can right. make that turn exactly. engineering-wise, come back and get back out on the property. So we could not have an entrance that was, say, 50 feet wide if an 18-wheeler needed 75 feet wide or 60 feet wide. Exactly. So those civil engineering drawings have to be made to staff and to NDOT, which we've been able to do, which I brought up a little earlier. It required us to widen it by six more feet right. um, in order to get that. So, and that was one of the things that in looking at through when I was listening to Ian at that middle section was right. emergency only. I always had been <laughs> thought that I was going to have egress only exactly. to make sure we had mitigated some of the cars right. going into the self-storage facility to be able to have a secondary way of getting out into exactly. Pyramid or another light down the road or Greenbrae or 4th right. Street. Yeah. I guess you we're both somewhat agreeing on on the problem here. I'm kind of interested on the other projects that we look at. Normally, it seems like we have letters from NDOT. You know, we're hearing a secondary, NDOT said this. I'm hearing from staff. I'm hearing from you. NDOT said that, you know, we, you know, we did a project two weeks ago that we looked at, and, and we have a letter from NDOT. It, it, it maybe staff can explain why there's no letter from NDOT. Um, it, you know, and maybe if that's okay at this time, just ask the question why there's not a letter from NDOT. There are comments. That's a comment Art, letter. Uh, yeah, or RTC and NDOT words. gave us comments. Okay. All right. And okay, so you can see that that's the thing. So we don't have a specific letter in this package because normally I would look at it and say, have you met there? Or I would condition showing, you know, something that NDOT has given us specifics because I'm very concerned getting on onto and, and approving something that appears to have problems, which we both kind of see what we need to rectify before on on this thing you know I'm, it, you know it's thrown flags i'm just not sure we're at the point to to in my in my opinion to to prove something here without the specifics everything seems to be ndot says this you know i'm not getting anything in specific and that's where i'm having trouble um we did receive comments from rtc and ndot mm -hmm. when the project was very first submitted of what we have to meet. Um, why they're not with you, I, I'm not sure. Um, and, and they've the, been, and, because the city of Sparks is who sent them to me. Do you, and, and to me, this, this needs to be rectified before, it, for, for me, as just one of the seven right. sitting here. Right. I, I have a trouble, I would almost rather table something than specifically until some of these things are resolved. And I and I don't know how I get a letter out of the yeah, Nevada Department sure of Transportation when they say, we'll issue you a final letter encroachment permit right. once you come in with your construction drawing. So we I, have to have specific civil engineering standards met by Nevada Department of Transportation before they'll issue an encroachment permit. So if they come back and say, well, your entrance needs to be a little bit bigger, right. then I have to do that if I'm going to get an approachment permit. So as much as I would love to yeah. be able to have that right now, I've asked. <laughs> so um, yeah. and I'm saying submit it with your construction drawings, and then we'll tell you, redline the drawings to say what you need to make it work. They, they literally are telling me, we're only going to give you one entrance. You're not going to get two. Yeah, okay. Mr. Chairman, if I ask you, Michael. Yes. Um, to get permission to use that egress for on to Richard's place. Yes. Would that suffice a 18-wheeler? Oh, absolutely. Okay. 
So it would not have to back up. It wouldn't have to go anywhere. It would go just in go straight and out. Straight out. Okay. Yeah, um, but and I would think, just just to preface that, that to make that radius, we may have right. to paint the curb red or widen the curb in order. Which the, again, civil engineers would say, Mike, in order to make this turn in this radius, you have to have this wide, and that's what I would have to do. Yeah. Yes. But on, on our property, feasibly, an eighty wheeler could get out there. That's correct. Place. Oh, absolutely. Okay, good. Absolutely. Good. My uh, question is why I <laughs> because most, I can far see you coming in with more heavier vehicles for commercial than you could for those many warehouses. Right. But I. Oh, go so ahead. that was my original question. Do you I'm have sorry. some kind of tenant in mind for those commercial buildings? I have tenants I would like to see there, yes, absolutely. Um, um, and we did it as an office retail building because there's a possibility that an insurance company wants to come in, a beauty salon comes in, but and preferably a, a Chipotle or a, a Subway sandwich or something along those ways. Um, it's being we're certainly designing it so that potentially one or two of those units could be of some form of like a Chipotle fast food Subway type of store. And those aren't 18 wheelers, those are 10 wheelers. No, I know, yeah. They yeah. come in with deliveries quite often. Correct. And my point is now that your, your storage units will be 24 hours a day. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. No, no. We'll limit the, in, we'll limit the time coming in to 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock or 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. type of thing. No, they will not be 24 hours. No, I'm sorry, but I, that's another you know, commercial. They're usually an eight-hour day, and then you're, the traffic that's going to come out is going to come come in, and go out in peak hours, and everybody wants to avoid the Pyramid Way or peak hours. Right. And, and I, I, I had the same concern you had mm -hmm. when I read this that I, I see a nightmare there. I really do with some of the traffic that might be generated by the commercial units far more than many more sort of storage. If if you have somebody in the commercial units and and you they can degress off that back gate going on to is that Richard's way? Rich yeah. place. They have to go through your gate. Don't they? Oh they would. Yeah. Yeah. And so would they be assigned a, a number so they could get out that other way? We could set it up certainly that way. Now, there's another possibility, and the, the fire department um, um, would like to have had, a, you know, that I don't think they'll give us the, an egress out onto Richard's place on that north side, um, but it's possible. And if that's an emergency lane, I'm going to walk Richard's. You, you mean made, off the they, north? They had you put it in there for emergency. Yeah. Are you sure you really want to run traffic out of there? And you never know when an emergency be. No, 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 no. The only one that is in the oh, middle. Okay. That's right. The only one is in the middle. The, the the gate on the north side and the gate on well the northwest and the northeast. Those would be locked with a, um, a knock box um, for or a chain just for the fire department to access those only. Yes, sir. I'd like to get that exact. The, the legal standpoint of what we're approving, Doug, uh, what's on the drawing here shows three emergency yes. exits. And you're talking about the middle one being regular customer egress. And if we approve this as it is, I, I don't think we're approving you to do that. Is that then I would Then I would, I would leave it out. without redrawing a map right. this evening. But I, Mr. Ornelas might have a different viewpoint. So uh, a couple of thoughts. Um, one, I'm going to ask uh, Ian to come up here and uh, summarize the comments uh, we received from MDOT and RTC. Um, you know, certainly with uh, you know, this, this conditional use permit uh, is specifically uh, for the uh, many storage use. The, the commercial and office use uh, is allowed by right. So. 
uh, you know, the use that you are concerned particularly about maybe generating the most traffic is a use that's allowed by right. It would not require a conditional use permit, right? right. This, is, this is zone Z, C2, right? Um, so, um, you know, in, in the case of many special use permits in the past and the conditional use permits in, in currently, um, and certainly with regard to uh, our standard practice with regard to administrative reviews, which is, you know, essentially what this uh, conditional use permit is, is serving as, um, you know, the planning, I might suggest to the planning commission that you add a condition that uh, stipulates that ingress and egress to and from the site shall be to the approval of the city engineer and to uh, an NDOT, right? And so you would need, I mean, they're going to have to have NDOT's approval. Uh, and, you know, requiring uh, ingress and egress from the site to be to the approval of the city engineer so that the city has a role uh, is, is, a, is a common type condition that we utilize with these types of permits. So that's a suggestion, but uh, I, would, I would ask Mr. Crittenden to uh, at least summarize the, the comments we got from NDOT today. Wait, can I interject just one more time? I, I think that Mr. Arnelis's proposed solution um, probably is adequate to cure the deficiency that, that you've identified. Um, I would um, I would caution you, though, that while Mr. Arnelis is absolutely correct that two of the three proposed uses are allowed by right, the conditional use permit does need to be evaluated in the context of the of the whole and and how they you know play off one another. Um, with a view towards mitigating the impacts of the entire project uh, and the way it interacts, way, way, the way the three inter uses interact with each other and how they affect the surrounding properties. And, and so um, with that, you can go ahead and I would request, Ian, that you take those documents and you give them to Marilee and that they be added into the record of this evening's meeting. All right, I, and I apologize for these uh, letters not getting into the that, that standard practice and somehow I managed to forget to put them into the, uh, the staff report. Um, the, the notes from uh, NDOT uh, are, are very uh, generic, uh, basically saying that, that the applicant will have to apply for a, uh, a encroachment permit. Um, An occupancy permit for any work performed in the right of way. Uh, they'll want drainage plans of how the drainage from this property is going to interact with the drainage in their right of way. Uh, uh, they'll want traffic impact uh, analysis to talk about how that traffic is going to impact the, the, the traffic in their right of way. Uh, and then What mitigating features they're going to install to to, to address that, which would uh, boil back to the uh, discussion on the the medium that was asked to be installed. Um, and, and like Mr. Marty had said, uh, typically these specifics of site design at that that detail are typically done in house through through staff. We're going to require that that. And uh, approves any any their, their driveways, and our engineers are going to review those to make sure they meet our standards, and so on and so forth. Uh, the also, I, I don't think that the the drawing that I have is is uh, it's necessarily the best drawing for this, as it is the landscape plan. So it's not going to have necessarily those details fully drawn out. Uh, but there would be detailed drawings for those specific curb cuts, the specific turn radiuses, all those kind of things would have to be provided in order for us to be able to approve the, that work to be done. So, so I have a question for Ian. Should that have been put in the conditions of approval? Typically they're not because it's going to be required by code anyway. I mean, the, the, those aren't, sometimes they are in specific circumstances. This, this was not one that I anticipated because they'd already been in contact with him and talked to him about some of those things. Um, and from the staff perspective, in the discussions we've had, they'd never come up as one of the concerns that we've had uh, a ton of heartburn about because we knew NDOT was going to require whatever they were going to require at that intersection. 
And so we just assumed we'd, we'd wait for those to come in. So we, we don't always put conditions for every thing because a lot of them are going to be required by code or state law or, or wherever those things come from. Thank you. I, in a, in, I'm still very uncomfortable. I don't like designing things or, or back and forth. I like us looking at something that's, that's there and then we review it. So I still have problems at this point um, doing anything except tabling this because I do not feel I have enough data to do this proper review at this time. It would be nice if you could get it, you know, that we're having some closer. I, I don't feel we should ever be involved with the design. We're doing a review at this point. So, you know, um, as we get farther, I, there's more things I could discuss, but to me, I'm, I'm going in the direction of not approving this project at this point that you come back with more specific data. And specific. I don't know if we want to keep you discussing it, but I, but that's a motion I will probably make. Well, let's, this is a public hearing, so yeah. um, is, understood, we will call yeah. for that vote. Of course. Are there any more comments or questions uh, for the yeah, planners? Uh, yeah, more question on, on the design here. And I don't know when this happened, but obviously the major work being done on Pyramid Way. This site, um, site plan shows Pyramid Highway being two lanes in each direction in front of this site. Um, but is it, is, is it down to two lanes at each, each the, way at that point? six lanes. It's two lanes all the way past, um, I think it's Richard's Way and I think there's about three or four more houses that they have not taken out. So it was one of the items that I went on to NDOT's website, which you can pull up and see everything that they did. And part of the traffic study that was done um, for staff and for myself and for NDOT was to look at that as an evaluation. Um, if I would have moved the entrance to line up with Scalari's, and that wouldn't have required a median. The, pro the reason they're asking for the median is our driveways don't line up, so there's going to be the turning, exactly. you know, where people are going to either try to mm -hmm. be turning into mine or Scolari's, even though Scolari's has Pullman. Um, I agreed to put the median to to mitigate that situation. So pretty right. much whatever. I have to work out with an engineering, civil, or um, structural with NDOT, RTC, or the city, uh, the city engineering and building department. We have to meet those standards. Okay, any more questions for Mr. Martin? Okay. So, any okay. more questions for senior planner? There being none, this is a public hearing. Uh, we now like to open up for public comment. Would anyone like to be bring, come forward to discuss? Close the public comment section. Let's bring this back to the committee. Any discussion? Uh, Any I'd discussion? like to. Um, I'd like the uh, commission to consider. Um, the condition that, that um, Armando suggested, which um, before we decide what to do on it, but the, the condition yeah. will be in there if we, no matter what we decide. And this would be condition number nine, which is on page nine of our material. <laughs> Uh, access into and out of the site shall be to the approval of the Nevada Department of Transportation, the city engineer, and the fire marshal. Um, Mr. Attorney, so that will allow, the, if the project does move forward, that will allow ultimately the egress to be changed if those three parties approve it? even though we're approving it as an emergency exit? Well, I, I mean, I think that the, the answer to your first question is yes. Um, 
the answer to your second question, you know, in terms of approving it as an emergency exit, I think you could specifically disclaim the idea that that's what you're doing if, if that is in fact your int intention. If you don't want to approve it as an emergency exit, then I would say so. Uh, whether it's as part of the conditions or whether it's just as part of your, your motion, you know, I, I would specifically indicate that that is your intention. As an emergency exit only. Not being that it would not be an emergency right. exit. Okay. And um, could I then comment? My, my comment is, again, I don't feel we're at the position yet <coughs> be able to just turn that out or approve the thing. I would like to see, I would like to see NDOT's things. I would look, but like to be able to look at what they come up with before we approve a project. I don't like approving a project at that point. So, you know, that's my, my feeling in that. I would like it to come back to us after we get specifics from NDOT and specifics from our engineering. I'm, I'm just not ready to vote on it to just Put a condition like that at this point. And if I may ask in terms of uh, clarification, what, what specifics uh, do you want to see? Well, I want to see specifics of what MDOT is looking as far as design. I want to see that that staff feels this is a project that that can be. I, that's my requirement to approve a project. A project at this point. I don't have enough data to say whether this could work, and I'm, I'm really against approving projects. So I, w I want specifics and agreements with NDOT and the applicant. I know he's trying to get that, and I want that done before I feel that I should approve a project like this. So uh, I want more specifics. I guess my comment on that would be that um, you know, there are many instances where, you know, those sorts of issues are worked out through the, sure. as we move through the design process. Right. Um, so, so but, in, in, yeah, so we got a different opinion, and that's, that's fine. Well, so I'm going to suggest that I, um, I'm going to, uh, to make the motion, which we can either approve or disapprove then. I know that. I'm telling you what my plan is. Commissioner Voles, before you do that, um, I understood your question earlier uh, when you when you said I'd like the commission to consider this issue on the ninth condition right. uh, that you spoke. When you started down that path, I thought that um, the commission would would perhaps take a separate vote on on whether or not to include condition nine. We did not do that, and so if it is your intention to make a motion to approve the project subject to the inclusion of condition nine, you need to specifically say so in whatever motion you're about to make. All right. So any further discussion? On traffic, is there a traffic study? Are, are we supposed to see it or, I mean, I guess what my question is regarding it is, has been brought up by Commissioner Sperber is uh, just the size of trucks happen to get in and out and whether it blocks. So I don't know if there was a traffic study done. I thought I heard you say that five, it's five to 10% that you would see an 18 wheeler ever come in. So. Please come forward. Yes. <laughs> Um, the traffic study was commissioned by NDOT. Um, I mean, Paul Salegi, I hired to um, give us an analysis of specifically Pyramid Way based on this particular project. Paul Salegi met with NDOT, got specific requirements of what they wanted, and based on this traffic study, I did not need a median as long as I moved the entrance. So I thought the entrance was better where it was at based on a direct approach into the self-storage facility, which is 80% of the project. So meeting again with NDOT, I agreed to put the median in for right-in, right-out only. Would I rather not have right-in, right-out only? 
yes, I would much rather not have the median mm -hmm. in there. It limits the amount of people that will be able to come in. So the traffic study um, was provided in this conditional use staff report. So um, in terms of whether or not NDOT will or will not approve, they're very specific that I have to bring construction drawings to NDOT for a final approval letter. So what um, Mr. Sperber yeah. is asking of us is to go spend, which I have contracts right now that I'm getting ready to sign tomorrow, if this was approved, for $155,000. So what you're asking me to do is go spend the $155,000, submit to NDOT before I have a conditional use permit. Um, again, it's like putting the cart before the horse, and I have to meet standards by NDOT, regardless of the city of Sparks, in order to get an encroachment permit. They're not going to give me the permit. Uh, it belongs to Walmart, um, and as I buy the property, I have to submit for another encroachment permit. So if my civil engineer's giving them drawings that says this is going to work and they have to literally physically show on a big, you know, 24 by 36 map, the radius turns of that vehicle, of exactly what that vehicle does, mm -hmm. and the engineers that end on, I have to meet whatever those requirements are. Yes. If, even if it means redesigning a portion of the entrance. Mr. Chair, I just have a follow-up to that. I guess what my my ultimate question is, is had the traffic study with the answers to NDOT been in our report, would this have helped some of the commissioners come to a final answer? And I don't know who addressed that, too. I don't know how to answer that. So do that. I address it to staff or legal? <laughs> well, I think you address it to okay. the other commissioners. And I, them, too. <laughs> I, I would add, I don't want to put words in. If you have this information and, and NDOT has seen this information and they've indicated that these are the standards you're going to have to meet, why it is that the, that the drawing that he's looking at isn't accurate or, is. isn't, or isn't acceptable exactly. in, the, in the context of the emergency exits and whatever else. This is the drawing. That is what I meant. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is the exact drawing we gave to NDOT when we sat down with them. They're the ones that requested and had us not only widen it to make that radius turn, but put the median in to make it right in, right out. So as many times as I've talked to NDOT myself personally, trying to get the specific standards, they say, well, here's our book, just like the orange book that is the engineer at the city of Reno or city Sparks has. We have to go by those standards. Right. I think now I have a question. I am sorry. Yes. <laughs> Excuse me, Ms. Marty. The drawing I have in front of me shows three emergency exits on R Richard's place. Technically, basically the one in the alley plus two. Two in the alley. Okay. Right. So are there two or three emergency exits? At this current time, there are four. There's another one at the very front of the retail building on the north side. Gotcha. Thank you. Welcome. Where, Sorry. where is that? Uh, where is that? It's on the north. It's the retail the building. North. You can see maybe if this maybe if this gets blown up. Ian's showing it on the big screen. It's, Yes, it's on your. It's on oh, that's an in, internal emergency gate. Oh yeah, yeah. it's an internal, internal. emergency oh. gate, not, right. not a. Oh, yeah, I'm an okay. Yes. That's what that's, we were both confused. Okay. okay, thank you. Internal. That's not a. Okay. I was being more literal. Sorry. Yeah. Is not further sure. questions for the applicant. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion, if I may. Okay. Tell me if you're going to, you're going to make a motion 
to, to approve, then we need to add that condition. Right, right. right. And that's what I was going to try to do. Um, I'd like to make a motion, uh, number one. I move to approve the major deviation associated with PCN 15063, adopting findings MD1 through MD5, and with back supporting these findings as set forth in the staff report, subject to the conditions of approval one through three, this is in the staff report. Uh, also, condition number nine as submitted and written, which would be um, given to the secretary. Nope, not for that. Not for that. That one. would be for the next one? Yes. That's for okay. Then the subject conditions of approval one through three, this in the staff report. So this, this condition would be added to the second, second. item that yeah. we approved yes. the first item. Very good. Second. Call for a vote. Um, let, me, let me discuss. So the first thing we're voting on is specifically on the deviation, right. not on approval of the project. Right? Right. Okay. So we have a motion, and that motion has been seconded. All in, in favor? And, and one one comment, I I won't be voting for this because of my concern on the next item. I, I almost wonder if you if the that. motions are out of order. I mean, I understand that that's the way they are on the page, but as a practical matter, I, so number I wonder. Two carries the condition. Well, number two carries the condition that yes. that you've been talking about. But I think what you have to ask yourselves before you vote on the major deviation issue is whether or not you would approve the major deviation absent an approval of the conditional use permit. I agree. So, yeah. so don't so do them backwards. Can we then not strike that? I just withdraw the motion. And I sorry. withdraw my motion as submitted. Okay. So we will bring it back to the commissioners. <coughs> prepared to do it again, Tom. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion. I move to approve condition use permit SP150007 associated with PCN 15062, adopting finding C1 through C6, and the facts supporting these findings as set forth in the staff report, subject to the conditions of approval 1 through 8, as listed in the staff report, with uh, condition number 9 um, as submitted to the secretary, added to. Okay, we have a second. Moment. Call for a vote. No, let, me, just let me make a comment here. At this point, I, I would rather table this and get some more detail and not vote for this project at this time. So I will be voting against this for that reason. So no, we call, we'll vote. we're calling for a vote. We have a motion we have an approval and we have a, a, a second to that right. motion all in favor aye aye aye, aye. all opposed opposed okay um, we now have a motion for what was listed as item number one which will now become item number two right you don't have the motion yet you're asking for one. Well, I'm asking <laughs> for a motion. Item one. Would anyone like to come forward? Yes, I will. Uh, I, I move to approve the major deviation associated with PCN15063, adopting findings M1 through M5, and the facts supporting these findings are set forth in the staff report, subject to the conditions of approval one through three listed in the staff report. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. There will be no on that also. Yes. Motion yes. All right. We're through. <laughs> we are. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Um, we'll bring it back for general business. Uh, item number nine on the agenda. Washoe County School District Growth Impact Presentation, a presentation by the Washoe County School District staff regarding the impacts of anticipated growth with the district and current and future facility needs. Please introduce yourself. 
Right. Good evening, Chairman. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Kristen McNeil, Deputy Superintendent of the Washoe County School District, and with Welcome. me tonight is Mr. Etchart, who I'm sure all of you know. He's our Chief Operating Officer. Welcome. So tonight, the purpose of our presentation is going to give you some background and history on overcrowding and repairs issue within our school district, as well as going over some um, different types of growth uh, percentages, funding, school impacts, and finally, what this means for the future of our students. All right, so I'm going to dive right in. I just want to really, again, thank you for your time tonight. I know it's a beautiful night in St. Patrick's Day and NCAA basketball, so I appreciate your time here. But I know this is a huge issue for, for all of us, and I think it's a great opportunity for us to really tell you the situation we're in so you as planning commissioners can completely understand the situation going forward. Now I'm going to dive right in. These numbers on the screen right now on the left, that's our current school capacity and that's the reason we're here. As you look at 107, 99, 110, we are over capacity as a school district. If you look at the numbers on the right, it basically shows what we are with portables. We as a school district are surviving based on portable classrooms and team teaching and other academic ways. But we have over 230 portable classrooms now as a school district. And you as planning commissioners know that when you build a school, the purpose for a portable is that we put a portable in as the school's growing until we build a new school and we pull the portables out. But we have a lot of portables now in our school district that are 30, 40 plus years old. And you know, if you're in the city of Sparks, if you go over to Reed High School, you can definitely take a look at them. And you know, really those, those should be condemned, to be honest with you. They were well past their life. And they put a lot of stress, obviously, on the school district. They're not easy to maintain. Uh, they're not easy as a school district. To make, you know, they take away playground space. They, you know, they're, they're just not the answer. Now, if we weren't growing and we were stagnant right now, we have a lot of school needs now. We need a new elementary school, a couple middle schools, a new high school, additions onto existing high schools. But the fact is, as we all know, we are growing. So when we talk about, you know, why are we in this situation? I really kind of got to back up a little bit. And this has been an issue in Washoe County for, for a decade. And it's taken a lot of major efforts to try to go for funding, and unfortunately they've all failed. And when I say, you know, we, I really talk about the community. The community has decided not to fund schools for many years. It started out with SB 154 back in the legislature in 2007, and that was not approved, but what they did is created WCSD out of that legislation in 2008. That went to the ballot. Unfortunately, I don't think you could pick a worse time to actually put something on the ballot, you know, than with the economy, and it failed. You know, I think we lost, probably all of us remember AB 46 in 2013 that went to the legislature, and again, they didn't take action, but they empowered the county commission to take action, and again, that failed. So we are in this situation now that we still only have two current funding streams for building schools, repairing schools, and renovating schools, and that's government service tax and property tax. Now, government service tax right now has gone up. It's about $3 million a year. But we use those funds for all of our emergency repairs. When you see in the paper that a water line broke or you know, uh, Pine Middle School recently, this is the funding source that we use. It also pays for all the abatement and inspection programs we have and are required to do as a school district. The only real source we have for building schools, repairing schools, and renovating schools is property tax. And the good news is, I mean, we're going to generate about $35 million a year average over the next nine years. Now, that sounds like a lot of money, but we're going to kind of talk about what that money is. It is a lot of money compared to the last few years, because the last few years, we've had a bonding capacity of zeros. And the reason for that is, obviously, we had the Great Recession. And just like we all experienced, home prices plummeted. And so did the revenues and property tax that came to us. And I know this is an issue also in the city of Sparks, as, as Mayor Martini you know, highlighted in his state of the, the city address. So we have a cap that was put on, I think for good reasons, by the legislature when home prices were escalating so fast and your, you know, your property tax was going up probably faster than your, your salary was going up. I think that tax was, you know, the cap was put on. Unfortunately, that's going to take us a long time now to ever recover our property value revenue stream to build and repair and renovate schools. And actually, the 3% is probably optimistic. I see Clark County just issued a, uh, kind of it was in the newspaper at least this week, 
saying that their cap is really about 0.17 when you factor in the CPI and all the complicated factors that go with it. It's also impacted based on the property tax cap, the depreciating property tax, I should say, that we are the only state in the United States that has a depreciating property tax. And when you sell your house, it does not reset. So that one and a half percent it goes down every year has really impacted us. We have to have a certain amount of growth just to even maintain even. And we are, as has been said during AB 46 and previous times, the only county in the state of Nevada that only has those two property sources. Every other county has at least one, and with the exception of Carson City, has at least two other property or uh, revenue sources. Now, just because there's a check mark next to property tax for both us and Clark County doesn't mean we receive the same amount of money. Clark County, for instance, receives 42% more property tax per home value than we receive here in Washoe County. That is because it's a complicated answer a little bit, but because of the property tax cap that the state of Nevada has imposed at $3, basically it's $3.66 now, we are at the tax cap here in Washoe County. Reno, Sparks, Washoe County are all at the cap. So out of that $3.66, we receive 38.85 cents for school improvements capital side. Clark County, because they basically have the strip and they have a lot more commercial revenue, is not at the cap. And so they were actually able to put more money towards school construction. So they are about 55 cents in Clark County where we're at 38.85. And it's really just because of the revenue they receive from other sources. We are very dependent, as you know, in, in the, uh, northern Nevada on residential. City of Sparks probably at, at the leading edge of that. And why this is important, the funding stream, is, is a couple of things. One is we are an aging school district. The average age of our schools is 39 years old. And whenever you have older facilities, you have a lot of needs. So we have a minimum, a minimum need of about $20 million a year to try to work on the backlog that we have. We have about a $250 million backlog right now of just the expired and unserviceable needs here in the Washoe County School District. So even at $20 million a year, it's going to be many years, obviously, to be able to catch up. We have an older school district. I mean, my mother went to Mount Rose schools in the 1920s. And it's still in operation. Mitchell here in Sparks you know, is closing in around 100 years old. We have older schools. One thing I want to uh, point you to, especially as planning commissioners, and I think this is really important for the public to see, and we really try to uh, promote this every chance we can, if you've been to our website, you're going to see on there what's called the data gallery. And under the data gallery here this last year, we added the section that says buildings. And this was really from hearing it from the public during AB 46 about accountability, transparency of the Washoe County School District and how we spend our money. You know, there was a lot of talk about where does that money go? So we created this, and it basically works on Google Maps, and you can go on there and see heat maps, and you can look on there and see all the different schools. You can look at zoning boundaries. And it does three things, and I think they're really important. One is you can go to any school you want, click on it, and you'll see exactly the school capacities, you'll see the utilization of that school. You can look at an elementary school and see how many third graders or fourth graders go to that school. How many team talk classrooms are there? How many portables are there? This is really important information, I think, as people move into our area as we experience this growth, so they can actually see what is the schools my children are going to be going to? How much capacity is at that school? Are they being team taught? Will they be taught in a portable? You can also look back and see every school expenditure at that school, every bid. You're going to see who the, the winning bidder was. You'll see who the second, third, fourth bidders were. You'll see the exact amounts for every project. And then really importantly, as we go forward, you can see all those $250 million of expired projects. You can go right here and look and see what they are by school and give you a cost estimate of every project. And on those most critical, unserviceable needs, it'll actually even show you a picture of what that project is. So I think we've taken accountability and transparency for the buildings for the Walsh County School District to the cutting edge. I know of no other district in the nation that has anything greater than this. So as we go forward, as we start talking about economic development, I, I want to stress that we as a school district are excited about economic development. When we think about the opportunities for our K-12 students and higher ed students, I mean, it's, it's hard to not get excited about the switches and the Teslas coming to our community. But we all know the impacts 
that it's going to have on our communities, and that's what we want to talk a little bit today about the challenges we face as a school district. Now, we as a school district do not anticipate growth. We can't project growth. We don't know, the, you know what that is, but we are, and we do listen to those who are experts in this field. We were very actively involved both Kristen and I, on the Economic Planning Indicator Committee that was put together by the Economic Development Authority of Western Nevada. They came together and they came up with the final report of having two scenarios on growth. The most conservative one was 1.7% average population growth for the next five years. That means about 1,000 students a year will be coming to the Washoe County School District. The more aggressive one was 2.4%. And if that holds true, that would mean about 1,500 students a year coming to the school district. Now, if you've listened to Mike Kazmierski, and you know, I know he's, he's, he talks a lot about economic development, he's using numbers much higher than 1.7 or 2.4. He's talking 3, 4, 5 plus percent growth. And that really shouldn't be a huge shock to us if we really look at the history of Washoe County. If we go back over the last eight, nine years with the, you know, with the Great Recession, that red line right there is the 1.7%. We've been well below 1.7. We actually had declining enrollment rates there for a few years. But if we look at the 17 years before the Great Recession, we averaged 3.5% enrollment growth rate. And we actually maxed out at 5.1. So we were well above that for many years. And a lot of that was without the economic drivers of what we're seeing with Tesla and Switch and others. So you have to make your own judgment of what you think the growth rates are going to be. I can tell you this, everything you're going to hear from me tonight about our needs are based on 1.7%. That's what we're using as the Washoe County School District. If it's 2.4%, you can take all the 10-year needs I tell you tonight and make them five. That's how it works. So I always throw this slide in there, and as, as planning commissioners, I mean, this is what you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. We all saw that headline, it was, it was broadcast a lot nationally, why Reno is going to be America's next housing boom town. And a lot of these projects that I show here are ones that we knew about uh, when I was the city engineer for the city of Sparks. I mean, it, this has been around for a long time before the Great Recession, and a lot of them now are being brought back, and they're being kind of dusted off, and we're starting to see the first phases of a lot of these developments. And the reason this has such a huge impact on the city of Sparks and Reno, Washoe County, and the school district is this. Let me kind of give you an example. And the reason I give this example is just to show the public that when this new growth comes, the schools don't come with it. Okay? We have a lot of rules we know through Nevada Revised Statutes about how schools are built and how they're paid for. If you build right now a brand new $300,000 home, we receive about $5,000 of bonding capacity from that home. That's selling a 20-year bond on that $300,000 home. So for the Washoe County School District to build a $23 million elementary school, we would need 4,600 homes to be built. So we have the bonding capacity to build that school. The problem is, when you build 4,600 homes, the impact is about two elementary schools worth of children, a fifth of a middle school, and a fifth of a high school. So the needs from those 4,600 homes is approximately $80 million, and we receive $23 million. And we all know from property tax, when you build a home, it can be about a year before you actually receive the revenue. And then, unfortunately, it's two to three years to build a middle school. It can be three, four, five years to build a high school. So there's a real lag between those homes being built and students being here and the revenues to come to even remotely try to build the schools. We reached out to a national expert. We knew the situation we were facing. We were looking at this, but we wanted to see outside the box thinking. We reached out to the Cunningham Group, a gentleman named Tim Defoe, who's a worldwide expert on school planning, and knows our district very well. And there were some great takeaways that came from, from his, uh, his report to us. One, he used the term, and I had used it before, but he reiterated it, was we're facing the perfect storm. We're, we're a school district that is overcrowded. We're at full capacity with, with limited room. We have growth coming, Lim maybe significant growth coming. We have a repair backlog in our old schools, and we have very limited funding to do anything about it. That truly is the perfect storm for the Washoe County School District. The other takeaways from this report is, is that overcrowding is real. I mean, it's, it's not just you know, uh, an issue for the district. It's an issue for the community. And we're not going to fix it by rezoning. 
when you're at full capacity, moving a handful of kids from one school to another is not going to solve the problem. We're not going to use, be able to use commercial space. I know that, that it's popular and we really tried. We took bus tours of all the uh, empty Kmarts and facilities and saying, could we turn this into a school? The takeaway was, once we looked at zoning code, all the different issues, it was going to cost as much to, to renovate those old buildings and turn it into a school as it would be to build a new school. So his major takeaway from this was that we need to build to avoid the worst outcome of all. Any resources we have should be applied to trying to avoid double sessions. And I'll give you a quick scenario that Kristen will talk more about on the academic side. Double sessions means that we're putting two schools into one. It means you're going to run a morning shift at that school and an afternoon shift. Now Clark County has done this. And basically the morning shift starts at 5.55 a.m. and goes to 11.55 a.m. And the afternoon session goes from 12 o'clock till 6 o'clock. Now, being a rural and urban school district as we are in Washoe County, we have a lot of bus routes, and I oversee transportation also. We've got many bus routes that are hour, hour and a half, even some up to two hours long, but we have many an hour, an hour and a half. So we're talking children at a bus stop as early as 4.30 in the morning, and even earlier. We're talking about students getting off out of school at noon, and where do they go until you know, the parents come home? So I think we can all recognize the impact that would have, not only on children, not only on families, but the impact that's going to have on our economy. I know Mike Kazmierski says it often. You're going to see another article coming out this weekend from him saying it again, that the biggest hindrance right now to economic development continuing is having enough homes for these people to live as they move to our community and having schools to educate their children. Because I think we can see the nexus between homes and schools that if we can't, if we have to go to double sessions, how difficult it's going to be for a developer to sell a home to a family when the first thing we all know when you're a family is you look at what the schools your children are going to be going to. And if they're on double sessions, it's going to make it very difficult to sell those homes. So I really stress to the community, and believe me, I've given this presentation probably 60, 70 times. I hope to give it another 200 times before November. And I have to always stress, I'm not advocating for the ballot issue one way or the other. I legally cannot. All I can do is educate and answer your questions on this. So that brings us to the additional funding. And what the legislature did for us through SB 411, Senate Bill 411, was create the Public Schools Overcrowding and Repair Needs Committee. It's totally separate from the Washoe County School District. And I thank the City of Sparks if for giving us a fantastic representative that represented you, Mr. Sean Carey, who uh, ended up being the chairman of this group. And they've done a fantastic job of really diving into this issue and really looking at it in great detail. I'll tell you, they went into the subterranean on this issue with the really see. They voted unanimously that there is indeed an issue and it needs to be solved. Now, they just recently came up with what they feel is the proper solution to this which is going to be a ballot question in 2016 to provide $781 million over the next nine years to build about 15 schools in northern Nevada. It's a 0.54% sales tax increase. That was the solution they came up with. Again, this is completely independent from the Washoe County School District. This was the community speaking. Everybody from retail to mining was on this organization. So again, we're not supporting it, we're not opposing it, obviously, but I'm educating you on where we are right now. And with that, I'll turn this over to Kristen. So when we talk about um, the plan that the school district put together, one of the very first foundational aspects that we really wanted to talk about was school safety and what that looks like when you're overcrowded. And as a former principal at Marvin Moss, when we were talking about going possibly multi-track when Copper Canyon was up there, I can tell you student safety on our playground was a tremendous issue. It was an issue for us as, as principals and teachers and parents. So that was the number one guiding factor when we were talking about how are we going to put this plan together. The second one that we wanted to talk about was student achievement. You all know that we have the highest graduation rate in the history of Washoe County School District at 75%. That's not good enough though. We know that we have work to do within our subpopulations. Special education is one of those areas. But when we're talking about overcrowding, and these additional programs, it really becomes a stress on the, the staff as well as the, the uh, school itself on where are we going to put these programs. The third was minimizing disruption. So Pete talked about uh, double sessions. 
We already have four of our schools slated to go multi-track in 17, 18, 2017 and 18. And a little bit about multi-track, those are four tracks, so 75% of your students are in the building at any one time, 25% are off. And we've been through multi-track before. We want to do improvements around that. But again, it's a disruption to family. So go back in your minds and imagine yourself being a parent with three children, one in elementary school, one in middle school, and one in high school. You could possibly have a child on a multi-track system as well as a double-track system not the best and not the most conducive for families. The last one, obviously, what we talked about is trying to avoid multi-track and double sessions at all possible. So as Pete referenced, what does $780 million do over a nine-year period of time? It helps us out tremendously. Um, again, we cannot advocate. We cannot say for or against. We can only educate you. So what does that mean? It means that we're going to be able to finally be able to repair and renovate. So when a school such as Pine Middle School has a flooding incident, as it did, we'll be able to have funds and we won't have to pull out of our emergency contingency funds for that. Also, um, different types of maintenance, operating and repair. We had a situation a couple years ago where Incline, their entire heating system went down. Also, um, expanding, so once you have more students, more teachers, you're going to need more buses. Where are you going to put more buses? Right now, we're at full capacity with our bus yards. Obviously, we're going to need new um, facilities for our nutrition system as well. So I'll talk a little bit really quick. And you have this information. This is more for you to look at in your packet. But what it would actually mean as far as schools is we would have three new high schools under this plan. And also, we're going to look at repurposing the, exist the existing Hug High School and turning it into something more like an AACT, if you've been there, a career tech type school and building a new Hug High School. Specifically for Sparks, I just wanted to really mention really quick that we are looking at purchasing those properties that would be in the southeast corner of Sparks High School to ultimately be able to expand Sparks High School into a full 2400 to 2600 uh, comprehensive high school. It's obviously at one of our smallest high schools right now. And with the growth, we know we're going to need to totally renovate and expand Sparks High School. That would be 10 years out, but we want to start purchasing those properties. In the middle schools, we're looking at three new middle schools, one Sun Valley, Arrow Creek, and Spanish Springs area. These are really high priorities, especially Sun Valley. As you see, it's our highest priority besides the addition on the Monty Ranch High School, which is really bursting at the seams. But it's, these are really critical for us. And on the elementary school level, as Kristen said, we're already going to be implementing multi-track year-round. We know four schools right now, but it looks like we may have 12 based on, on the growth projections here by 17, 18 that could actually have to go to a multi-track calendar. Now, not every elementary school can go to a multi-track calendar because you need a certain amount of classrooms to be able to implement it. If you don't have enough classrooms, then you have to look at other options. And those other options are getting really hard. I can tell you this on portables. Portables, like I said, are not the answer. Most of our schools are maxed out on the room even to put portables. Even if I wanted to place more portables, there's no room to put any more portables. So we're really facing a crisis there. The two elementary schools I showed there, South Meadows and the North Valley Spanish Springs area, those schools are needed to avoid double sessions at the elementary school level. And obviously, when we start talking about a third grader or a second grader at a bus stop at you know, 5 in the morning, it puts a whole different perspective on things. The core school investment is to actually invest money into those oldest and most at need schools in the urban core, both in Sparks and Reno. And then lastly, the Public Schools Overcrowding Repair Needs Committee voted to build a seven additional elementary schools to remove, ultimately, the usage of that multi-track year-round calendar. So this is a, this slide just shows the total of that. And as Kristen said, we obviously need to expand nutrition services and transportation to go with this. Because even if we don't build more schools, we will need to feed them and, and transport them. So what does this mean for the future of Washoe County School District? So just very quickly, obviously, overcrowding is one of our huge, uh, biggest challenges right now. Um, we can't. But just as Pete said, we can't support, we can't advocate for, um, but we do need to educate many, many people as what this means for us. And then as far as the current and future, so what does this mean in, a, in an elementary school? So right now, if you were to walk into Brown Elementary School, their computer lab is being used as a kindergarten classroom. 
So instead of students being able to walk into that computer lab and use it for what it was intended to do, you will see little five and six year olds, about 30 of them in that classroom. So this also means team teaching. Team teaching, just so you know, is one classroom with two teachers. We do have to abide by classroom size reduction standards, but still that's two teachers and about 40 to 45 kids in one classroom. Uh, class sizes and electives. If you have a high schooler, you, you've probably heard that some of our language classwork, uh, classrooms are upwards of 50 to 60 kids in one of those classrooms. Huge impacts, and when you're trying to teach geometry or AP biology, it's very difficult to be teaching that with that many kids. And then finally, as we were talking about earlier, one of the principles as far as safety, we have, there was a, there was a picture of, of students within a cafeteria. Our cafeterias are at full capacity right now. Some of our schools are running upwards of three lunches. So think of a first grader having lunch at 10 o'clock in the morning and going all the way through the end of the day and not being able to, we have snack time, we have to build in snack time. So lunches are tremendous and then also recesses, playgrounds. We meet on a weekly basis, academics and operations, I don't think there's a week that's gone by that one of our area superintendents hasn't come in and said we had another injury on the playground because of overcrowding. And then finally, um, I, I felt for this gentleman that just presented as far as pick up and drop off um, and, and egress and, and, and those types of situations. When we have 65 passenger buses coming in on a rotating basis and some of our schools have about 10 to 11 buses, that can be a danger when we're talking about traffic safety. So what does this look like? Multi-track year-round schools. We went into this, and, and that was that picture that I was talking about as far as the number of kids. Multi-track, you don't go out and say that you want to put a school on multi-track unless you absolutely have to. We can do it. We've been there before, but it's not optimum. And then again, as, as Pete was saying, I've taught in a, in a double-track school. I taught down in Clark County for several years, and Becker Middle School went on double session. I taught seventh graders from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. The last classes of the day back then was called computer literacy. Try and teach seventh graders computer literacy at 5.30 at night. It's not the best. So I'm just going to whip through these. We're talking about flooring. You can take a look at, at Swope Middle School and what we need as far as repair and, min and renovations. Walls and ceilings. These are in our schools right now. This is how it looks. Heating and air conditioning. That was Pine Middle School. Pleasant Valley. Again, I have 230 of these portables, and, and really, they're not portable anymore. We can't move these buildings, and when we do, they actually literally fall apart. Fields and gems. Roofs and boilers, Sparks High School. That's the boiler down in, in Sparks High School, right here in, in Sparks. Plumbing and electrical. I, I, th this equipment, I, I'm not going to give away my age, but just safely say that it's a lot older than I am. Um, renovated modern classroom. So we do, as, as Pete was mentioning, when we talk about reinvestment in our inner core schools, these are some of our schools in the inner core. They have already been renovated, and this is what it could absolutely look like. New schools, Kendall DiPoli built in 2009, um, one of the um, most energy efficient schools, um, and this is one of our, our newest schools. So we have two directions that we can go in. We can go in the direction as far as making sure that our students have the best available to them. And I'm not talking Rolls Royce models as far as schools, but we need new schools. Or we can go in the direction of doing absolutely nothing and having overcrowded multi-track schools and double session schools. We have one choice. I'll finish by telling you that as, as planning commissioners, I know that when uh, these projects come in front of you, we as a school district do not advocate, again, for the approval or denial of any project. We just want to provide you information. So we're going to continue to provide those development impact letters that basically will tell you this is how many students this development is going to generate, here's the schools they will go to, and here's the capacity of those schools. Now, we as the Washoe County School District, I'm on operations, but the academic side is going to continue to obviously educate those children no matter what calendar they're going to be put on. So that is our mission, and that's what we want to provide. But at the same time, I, we, we want you to have that information so you know what these developments, as far as what the impact is on us. Now, we completely recognize as a school district hypocrisy if we were to say, don't build this 
this development when we're pushing for economic development as a state, as a region, and then we're saying, yeah, but you can't come and live here. That's not our purpose. We just want to educate. So that's, that's again, we will continue to provide those development impact letters to you. With well, that, we'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I have a couple. Uh, real quick, you said you're like in charge of operations or when, when we, or if this money is ever come about, which we hope all of us do, um, would that, would you be hiring like carpenters and electricians and plumbers and all that for the school district? I mean, is all that part of it? Or is it just for the schools themselves? Well, let me make sure I kind of understand your question. I mean, we, we do two things. If we build these 15 schools, obviously we have to follow the statute, and so we'll be going out to build these schools using hopefully a lot of local labor to build those. Right. Now internally we do have some of our own electricians and so forth, but really our electricians and plumbers and so forth are really on the maintenance side. So yes, everything will be bid out. Um, we're very thankful the legislature has given us some tools to make uh, building of schools even more efficient than it's ever been. We're using now the construction manager at risk process for major construction projects. Uh, we meet, I just in fact met with two hours yesterday with the AGC. We continually work with them to try to find the best way of building schools and the most efficient way and hopefully getting people to work, right? I mean, getting people to work. Now, that being said, this is not 2008, 2012 anymore. It is harder and harder to find labor right now in northern Nevada. We recognize that even a lot of the projects we're putting out now, we're having to bid sometimes two or three times to try to get a good cost on our projects. So labor is a shortage. We all know that. I'm sure we're experiencing, I know you're experiencing the same thing here at the City of Sparks on projects. So we're going to continue to work with the AGC and others as far as, you know, all the trades and, and hopefully get the best price we can. These are major projects, and I think we'll get interest by the, the contractors to build them. And one other question for, for Christy. Um, the administrative end of it, you talk about double sessions. Mm -hmm. Like you were talking about, you were doing double sessions down in Vegas. Did you do like the whole day? Okay, I mean, would you have no, two teachers? We had two, we had two sets of teachers. We had two so sets you're going to need more teachers to boot anyway, right? I mean, the double sessions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely do. And and there's you know there's creative ways that you can staff a school such as that. Um, one of the things, and, and like I was saying, we meet every single week trying to crunch the numbers and what does this look like. Um, but you could have some, you know, the electives during the day, but. Then you have to worry about athletics, right. you know, and, and how are you going to run that? Or, you know, we've, we've talked about, look, how can your freshmen and sophomores go in the morning and then your juniors and seniors go? But then you possibly have a family that's split up as far as when those students are going. I don't know how you do it. There's no good answer to double sessions. Now, it was done one year, actually, interestingly enough, in the city of Sparks. Uh, when they were building Reed High School, they actually did double sessions for, for part of one year at Sparks High School. Sparks High School went in the morning, Reed High School went in the afternoon, and then Reed opened and we got rid, got rid of it. I remember when, I, when they built Foreign Strike, I was going uh, two sessions at Greenbrae. And then I went, when they were building Dilworth, I went two sessions at the old Sparks Junior High, which was down on 15th Street. So I used to go in double sessions there, and it was crazy. But it was nice when we, had, when we had a new school, though. Yeah. I did the same thing at Carson High School. I, yeah. I spent my freshman year in a bus barn doing double sessions in a bus barn until they opened up the new Carson High School. So, yeah. so, so I have a question. This $781 million is repairs and construction. And right now your repairs is like historical at 250 That doesn't project what this nine year will be what that 250 will grow to in terms of additional repairs? Yes, in the $781 million is a budget for $20 million a year uh, for critical maintenance needs. It also, though, has the $50 million for the inner city schools to make that infusion into the most it needs schools. So that'll help us a lot, too. Mm -hmm. And so we can start renovating those oldest schools and knocking that, that $250 million backlog number down. We, as a... Uh, as a district feel comfortable with that number. It's not extravagant. In fact, in the first scenario the Public Schools Overcrowding Repair Needs Committee saw, there was actually a $50 million number in there to kind of knock that number down quickly, to put a huge infusion into knocking it down. But that's one of the things as the committee did their work, decided to take out, just because they were trying to do that balance of keeping this affordable, but meeting the needs of the students.
is a relatively stable source of revenue uh, based on the depreciating nature of that tax and the way it's assessed against vehicles? You know, I, I'm not sure I can answer it completely, uh, not being on the financial side, but I can say that in the last several years, it's been very stable for us. It has actually grown from about $2 million to $3 million. But obviously, when we're talking $781 million, you know, $3 million doesn't go a long ways. And we use government service tax to pay for a lot of salaries. So it, it's kind of a stable source, but it's not enough to really bond, so we use it for those very critical needs. But it has been stable over the years. Now, I'll say that it hasn't been the most popular tax, uh, the government service tax or the vehicle privilege tax, as it's known as. There's been a lot of discussion at the legislature of removing it or eliminating it. So I never put great faith that, you know, it's always going to be there from one year to the next. But it's such an important source of funding for us, the way we use it. It would put us in a, in a, even further behind if something happened to that source. Thanks, Pete. This is a public hearing. Uh, you have an open item for public comment. <laughs> Thank you. This is for general public comment limited to items that do not appear on the agenda and is limited to no more than three minutes, as indicated by Mr. Bowles. For each commentator, pursuant to NRS 241, Point zero two zero. No action may be taken upon a matter raised under this item until the matter has been specifically included on the agenda. Is there any public comment? Um, we'll bring it back to the dais. Any last comments from the commissioners? There being none, I'd like to move for an adjournment. Please.